Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your people and kindle in us the fire of your love. Well, welcome to our online service. And um, Paul's going to be speaking to us today. But before we enter into it, let's just have a pause, a moment of quiet, where we invite Jesus into our time together. So let's do that now. Dear God, you are welcome here. You are welcome with us. Help us to give you pleasure with our worship. Help us to be touched by your heart. Amen. together the words of the prayer of preparation. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord, and our time of confession. Let's just pause and think about those things that we have done that we regret, those conversations that didn't go as well as they could have done, those times when we may have responded to an email, just not at our best, and those things that come between us and God. Dear God, I am truly sorry for those things that come between me and other people and come between you and me. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. And so a special prayer of God's forgiveness. May the Father of all mercies cleanse you from your sins and restore you to his image, to the praise and glory of his name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's say the words of the Gloria together. You may want to stand with me for this. And so we say together, glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, 
almighty God and Father. We worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. And so the special prayer for this last Sunday in the Epiphany season. God, our creator, who in the beginning commanded the light to shine out of the darkness, we pray that the light of the glorious gospel of Christ may dispel the darkness of ignorance and unbelief, shine into the hearts of all your people and reveal the knowledge of your glory in the face of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading is from the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verses 1 to 5. A great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and with the moon under her feet and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on its heads. Its tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that it might, might devour her child the moment he was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. This is the word of the Lord.
of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark beginning to read at verse 21 they went to Capernaum and when the Sabbath came Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach the people were amazed at his teaching because he had taught them as one who had authority not as the teachers of the law just then a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? A new teaching? And with authority, he even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Good morning, folks. Uh, I'm doing this from home, having just had my coronavirus jab. Uh, I should be using the pause button from time to time, and you can do the same. May the words of my lips and the meditation of our hearts be now and always acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Did you, I wonder, look at a fair bit of television over Christmas? You probably did. There wasn't a whole lot else to do in these strange times of pandemic and lockdown. And if you were glued to the box, were you, like me, struck by the sheer darkness of what was served up to us by way of festive entertainment? Of course, that wasn't the whole story. There were wonderful documentaries on the natural world, innocent kids' cartoons, soaring carols from kings. We could and did manage a good laugh. There were sweet and wholesome period dramas like Yorkshire Vets or Call the Midwife. But we had to look pretty hard, didn't we, to find those things. More obviously, the airways were saturated with terrifying perils, appalling cruelties, and perverse or extreme violence. Gruesome horror films, blood-spattered gangster movies, spaghetti westerns built on vengeance and masochism, unrelenting violence in spy films, bond films, war films. Horror broke in from outer space, in the form of alien invasion in Doctor Who. It came back to haunt us terrifyingly from a prehistoric past. That's Jurassic Park. It took the form of apocalyptic struggles of cosmic import. Behold, Luke Skywalker, our heavenly link man, our part of good or God, locked in deadly combat with principle of evil, Darth Vader. You and me, that's Dark Father. So there we sat, a people in darkness, in the midst of a vast, all too real natural evil, COVID-19 pandemic. We were, most of us, most of the time, whiling away the lockdown by consuming outsized portions of fictional disaster, of desolation on celluloid. And then right there with us, brooding over this whole universe of dark imaginings, was one genuinely brilliant 21st century epic, a follow-on from C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien, except that its author this time was an atheist with a very low opinion of the church, somebody seeking to understand truthfully and to reinvent for our times an account of the world's darkness and of humankind's own spiritual night quest talking about Philip Pullman, his dark materials. Whose dark materials might they be? Pullman is thinking of the fallen angel of the book of Revelation, that's to say Satan. He's drawing from the same final book of the Bible on the primitive religious myth 
that's what it is, of a war in heaven spilling over into a war on earth. But he has other dark thoughts too about the creator of Genesis. Now that should call people of faith to a sort of awakening. All these dark things indeed should jolt us into attending to the fundamental questions about evil. If and when they do that, they will prepare us to rediscover in renewed wonder what our God is really doing when he comes among us to deliver us from evil. Isn't that what the season of Epiphany ending today has been all about? Epiphany is a shining through, first discernment of the deeper or strategic meaning of Christmas. The people walking in darkness has seen a great light. Now, today's gospel gives us the opening of the public ministry of Jesus. In a synagogue, on the Sabbath, the kingdom and its bearer are proclaimed in a decisive first act of preaching and healing. Yes, that's right. The first care of Jesus' Messiah is to heal. The Dean of Litchfield explaining just recently why his cathedral has been turned into a vaccination center, pointed to just this first miracle of Jesus. It's right, isn't he? The new light, the new hope springs from this irradiating first act of God's care and concern for us. Mark famously says nothing about where Jesus comes from, unlike the other gospels. We remember, for instance, Matthew's dramatic account of the Christ child persecuted at the moment of his birth by Herod, but also adored by the wise men. That's, you could say, a double epiphany, a recognition coming from both the dark side in hatred and rivalry and from the light in wondering adoration. Our first lesson today from the book of Revelation is a reminiscence of that very episode. The woman about to give birth is Mary, and the devouring dragon who gruesomely attends the event is Herod. But Herod seen now in cosmic projection. He's a symbolic figure, isn't he? Standing for the principle of all evil. So he's also the Leviathan of Jonah and Job and the serpent of Genesis. And he's the prince of this world lurking in wait for Jesus already in the wilderness, seeking to devour and destroy him supremely at the hour of the cross. Think of the bigger picture. That's, the, that's what the first lesson is telling us. Think cosmic. Matthew, in his parallel account of the opening of Jesus's ministry, spells out the bigger picture by telling us that the teaching of Jesus relates to Isaiah 60, the prophecy of a day of the Lord's favor seen to be coming true in the sight and hearing of those present. Mark conveys this same message and its drama, but more indirectly and discreetly, by observing its effects on the eyewitnesses. People are, quote, amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as teachers of the law. What is authority? We see authority when the message comes from within as an assured conviction generating assent. It's not something transcribed laboriously, not a fragile inference, a vulnerable argument. It is fresh and lively truth springing immediately from some inner source, intimate to the speaker, inseparable from his very being, the sort of truth that translates at once into transforming acts. From Isaiah, we remember the coming day of the Lord's favor is to be recognized by an inaugurated series of blessings, good news proclaimed to the poor, freedom for the prisoner, recovery of sight to the blind, the oppressed set free. In other words, the ills of the human condition, the defects of human society, and the seeming imperfections of God's creation, all these forms of evil are lifted, removed. 
What's new in Mark is that the proclaiming of the kingdom, together with its first act of healing, points to a greater, an unimaginably greater series in the order of redemptive transformation. With the coming of the Messiah, the work in creation of God himself is now seen as being in process of completion. The kingdom is here right now. It's a reality inaugurated among us, but also it's in process ever of ever greater becoming and it seeks a fulfillment still to come, a cosmic second coming. Within 30 years or so of this first proclamation, St. Paul will be saying, Romans 8.22, that creation itself is unfinished. It is groaning in a trans travail of cosmic birthing. And suddenly we realize the word imperfect used by Pullman and a whole line of atheistic thinkers has a second meaning, a whole other life. It doesn't have to mean second rate, full of holes and errors, disappointed. Its other meaning, etymologically, is unfinished. The kingdom, as understood in larger cosmic frame, and it is from after the resurrection, really, will be seen as creation mark two. It's a renewal of the world initially set up in Genesis. It's a redemptive regeneration, embracing the cosmos entire. Now, is that second sense important? Does it react on Pullman and his problem with the dark materials of Genesis? You bet it does. If Pullman had understood the Christian doctrine of divine creation that way, in the perspective outlined by Paul's image of a cosmic birthing, I doubt if he could or would have put God in the dark. That expression, by the way, is the title of a series of posthumously published essays by C.S. Lewis. The central idea being that the modern mind wants not to stand under the judgment of God, but to stand in judgment on God. Pullman's work indicts God as an incompetent artist, failing to master all the dark stuff, all those remnants of primordial chaos and night that seem to make up such a large part of our own world. Now, he wouldn't have done that if he had got the idea of cosmic birthing, nor would he have felt resentment at any sort of absentee dark father disengaged from the work of his hands and neglecting to care for his human children. Lewis is right, those themes have roots in ancient forms of spirituality, and they run through the whole of post-enlightenment thought and literature, gaining momentum, shaping the mindset of our own secular times, the culture that we ourselves live in and so rarely attend to. Jesus doesn't put his heavenly father God. His intimacy with the Father is the antipode of that atheistic stance. Indeed, if we believe John's Gospel, it is the pre-planned and programmed antidote from the foundation of the world. But neither, on the other hand, does Jesus indict humankind, not for natural disasters, earthquakes, volcanoes, viruses, pandemics. Very prevalent take on, in the ancient world on infectious disease was that sickness sig signifies sin. Do you suffer? Well, that's because you're paying the price for some crime or misdemeanor. Your unhappy condition is a form of payback from a righteous and wrathful God, visited on individuals and families for past sins perhaps over many generations. That's worth thinking about. As long as that belief holds sway, there can be and there will be no intellectual awakening, no exploration of nature, no natural sciences, therefore, no immunology, 
and no NHS. Jesus the healer awakens us from that mental and moral slumber. Perhaps you remember in John's Gospel, it's chapter 9, the healing of the man born blind. Jesus is asked, who sinned, this man or his parents? He replies, neither this man nor his parents. No, the disorders apparent in created nature represent not the dark materials left over by some bungling demiurge, maker and orderer of the material world. Rather, they are the fields of God's ongoing and ever renewed effort of creation. And John says just that. This happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him by man. And they are still today in our NHS frontline workers. Now that's quite extraordinarily liberating. It sets us free from superstition, opening the way for genetics and virology and all the care we shall be receiving, many of us, this very week. And that's not all. Those same uh, liberation, that same liberation rescues us also from a depressed and oppressive culture of faith. Let's admit it, there's a darker, meaner streak running through some forms, past and present, of Christianity. Where does that darker streak come from? How does it creep back in? It develops, I think, out of the Augustinian notion of original sin, as interpreted by the popular blame game, which we have just seen Jesus rejecting. On top of that have come theories of divine primacy or of divine grace, which are seen to imply total human sinfulness, the abjection of man. Now that grim and sour mindset has done untold damage to our faith. Ask Pullman and his magisterium about that. Or else look again, as Barry was suggesting we do a fortnight back, at the role of the so-called friends of Job. No, Jesus says, I come not to judge the world, not to indict or condemn it as evil, and not most assuredly, to turn the world over to the avenging wrath divine, the wrath terminal and apocalyptic. Now, that's the outcome desired and more than just desired by many Americans calling themselves Christian, including just recently a good few of Mr. Trump's supporters. We saw that invading mob on Capitol Hill, did we not? Some with automatic rifles, and some waving placards with the slogan, Jesus saves. That's a problem, isn't it? For us and for them, for Christianity as a whole, what is it about that culture of faith and its theology of apocalypse which takes those folks over like men possessed and carries them to the point of sacred rage, intimidation and violence? No. Put up your swords, put up your swords. Jesus Messiah comes in peace. He comes that we may have life and have it more abundantly. One final thought. The ending of this episode from Mark holds an epiphany all of its own. In other incidents of healing by exorcism, the man possessed ends up clothed and in his right mind. He's restored to health and sanity. But the restored victim of this episode recognizes what is happening and who is doing it. And that's the real end time cure. That's where the salvation of the world is going. At the moment of paroxysm, the human spirit in thrall to evil has a true discernment of the transformation happening within him. And there is no compensating damage done. There is no transfer of blame or of harm. There is no remainder of contagion. We could see that 
very easily, very clearly, by comparing this episode to the episode of the demoniac of Girasa called Legion. Our man is set free completely and in the same process recognizes the author of that goodness, of that novelty of being, hence also his own real end and belonging. Evil is not passed on, it is absorbed, it is transformed, it is persuaded to the good and restored to God. Which gives us, if we think about it, a real and truly healing preview of the cross, of its meaning, of its action in the world. And that in turn gives us the pattern for our own response in faith. So let's close with a prayer. Lord, help us to receive the light of your coming. Give us the perseverance and the insight. Give us the courage born of hope to follow in its unfolding the way of truth that you bring. Give us so to take root in its riches of understanding and of empowerment that we may live to see with joy a world set free, cleansed, transformed. Lord, deliver us from evil and renew the face of the earth. Amen. Now, we're meeting together in our homes, but we're part of something bigger, not just a Christian community in Wellsbourne and Walton, not even just in the Diocese of Coventry, but we're part of the universal church. We're part of a church throughout our planet and we share in one faith. So let's share the words of our faith together and say, we believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. This Tuesday, February the 2nd, it is Candlemas, when Mary took Jesus to the temple to present him 40 days after his birth at Christmas. It is time to bless the candles in church and as we light our candles as an act of prayer, we light candles for the world, for others, and for ourselves. And we remember the promise of Jesus when he said, I am the light of the world. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has never put it out. To the words, Lord be light in the darkness, please respond, steady and strong, clear and true. Lord, we light a candle for peace in a world of broken promises. Let your light shine into the parts of the world raged by war and hunger. At this time, when our focus is the pandemic, we pray that your light will shine on these people. Be a beacon of hope to those who despair and are weary. Lord, be light in the darkness, steady and strong, clear and true. We light a candle of hope for families and friends who are special to us. We think now of a particular person or family where you want light to shine with hope or healing or forgiveness or celebration. At our last home group, we discussed each of us praying for one person or family who is particularly on our heart at the moment. We committed to pray for them for one minute at one o'clock every day. 
Maybe this is something you would like to do for people on your heart. To pray for one, for one, at one. These are your people. This is your light. Please put them together. Lord, be light in the darkness. Steady and strong, clear and true. We light a candle for guidance for people who are struggling at the moment with the pandemic lockdown situation we are in. We hold them before you now. Be their one true light and hold them to a true course and be with them in their struggle. Lord, be light in the darkness, steady and strong, clear and true. We light a candle for ourselves as we face particular issues this week. Decisions that can't be put off, pressures that are becoming overwhelming, people we simply must nurture and love. Be our light in the midst of these problems. Steady and strong, clear and true, as we worry and waver before you. Lord, be light in the darkness, steady and strong, clear and true. O oh God, we light candles for peace, for hope, for guidance. Let us not forget we light candles for joy and thanksgiving too. Light again in our hearts, we pray, the candle of your everlasting love as a light we can cherish and share. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's say the words of the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever.
And so a special prayer of God's blessing. The Lord bless you and watch over you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look kindly on you and give you peace and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. And so I really hope you have a good week ahead, that you stay safe and we will together beat this pandemic. But in the meantime, go in peace to love and to serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen.